The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This episode is brought to you by Capital Group, one of the oldest and largest asset management companies in the world, managing multi-asset, equity and fixed income investment strategies for different types of investors. Since 1931, Capital Group has been singularly focused on delivering superior, consistent results for long-term investors using high conviction portfolios, rigorous research and individual accountability. Hello, welcome back to another episode. I'm James Rickley. I'm joined by Justin Lucas today. Justin from Coda, thank you for joining me. Thanks, James. Happy to be here. Well, thank you for accepting my uh, my invitation to uh, to join. We've known each other for a long while, uh, for many, many years back, uh, at a bit of a distance these days. But uh, good to chat with you and catch up. And I thought it'd be, you know, it might be interesting for other people to have a listen uh, about what you're up to and and so forth. So maybe. Coda Capital, maybe give us a bit of you know, a few minutes on on what Coda is. We'll circle back to it, uh-huh. what you're up to now. But uh, yeah, tell us about Coda and your team, and let's go from there. Yeah, sure. So um, Coda is a business that uh, was founded about seven or eight years ago. A, f- a few founders, but principally by uh, Paul Heath, who many years ago was my boss at, uh, at Goldman Sachs, JB Weir, uh, and Steve Tucker, who was the the boss of MLC for for some years. Um, so they stepped out of their you know, very large, um, large bureaucratic uh, organizations. Um, sort of, uh, were looking to do something new, and we had this idea that um, they could start a firm that you know had similarities with the firms that they had been running in the past, but um, sort of distinguished distinguished itself um, for being entirely independent, um, not being aligned to a bank, not being aligned to a fund manager, and they thought there was a market in the high net worth and not-for-profit space uh, for that type of thing. Um, and there weren't a lot of competitors at that time sort of doing that in the high net worth space. It's sort of since changed where uh, there's there's more more doing it now, but that was sort of the, the idea. Um, and it's grown really strongly. And I joined, joined the firm with Alison Matthews, my business partner, coming up to five years ago. Um, and yeah, we've seen huge growth. So we've you know, started with with absolutely nothing and, and uh, you know, a couple of employees. And now we've got uh, sort of 120 employees, offices in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, uh, and managing about $11 billion. So uh, I think everyone's been happy with the sort of growth that we've had. It hasn't sort of all been smooth sailing with um, with getting new businesses going and challenges, et cetera. But uh, in the main, it, it's going really well. 120 people. That's a that's a big business. I, you know, I'd had an, a sense of there was a few people there, but I didn't realize it was quite that big. That's uh, that's incredible. Yeah, we've um, we made an acquisition uh, last year where we we uh, bought a business in Perth um, that was called Redwood Redwood Alliance. Um, now now Coda Perth, and that that added some employees. We're really excited about that. Actually, we think Perth's a, a great market. Um, Paul and Steve are actually originally Perth people, and um, we felt to do that market justice and to serve it properly, we really needed to have. Boots on the ground. It's a long way away, and you know, a slightly different market to, to other ones. And um, yeah, so that that expanded uh, the team uh, team quite a bit when we did that. Yeah, maybe let's go back a bit in your 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 journey in financial advice, as we were talking before we we pressed to record. You know, you have worked for some of the some of the bigger groups. You know, the, these groups that are targeting high net high net worths and not for profits and the like, as you as you touched on. I I suspect that's Probably a little bit different to where most of the people in the ensemble community might sit. Uh, I think the ensemble community is a lot of, often a lot of small businesses, you know, in, in individual advisors, and so forth. Um, so it seems like a bit of a different world, I would guess, from where a lot of them sit. But talk us through your kind of your employment journey to. Yeah, look, I mean, it is and it, and it isn't. There's certainly big sort of 
commonalities between what all advisors do, I think. But um, yeah, it is it is targeting a different segment, that's for sure. My career, as you know, sort of started um, in a um, you know, WHK Supermaster and um, a sort of a focus that you would you would understand. Um, I had a great time there, learned a lot. Um, great group of people. I used to work with a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, really the only reason I left is I wanted to wanted to travel and I, I um, backpacked around a- uh, Africa for a little while and then wound up in, in London. And I, I really didn't have um, sort of much expectation of what I would do in London. I didn't want to pour full beers, but um, I wasn't sort of sure how my financial um, planning, apparel planning background would translate to, to London. It's obviously a different market. The laws are different. So I didn't know, but I was really really fortunate it was sort of a, a lucky situation where um for me where, where UBS sort of had a lot of things going on in 2008 um and they had a, a lot of people leave the organization and they were you know they were really keen to get people uh, to come in and I was lucky enough I think there were 12 people that joined pretty much on the same day that I did and yeah. like six or seven of them were Australians and um, so it was a funny you know great fun sort of atmosphere and um yeah it was sort of an eye-opening to me, to, to work in that environment, it was sort of, you know, stereotypical private banking in Europe and London. We were right in the heart of, of Mayfair and Green Park, um, you know, incredible sort of wealth, um, very international. Um, they had sort of two floors and one of the floors was um, international desks and a Chinese desk and a Russian desk and et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so it was really eye-opening for me. It was certainly a, a really steep learning um, curve because it was a market I didn't know. Um, having an Australian accent, you know, people asked me to speak slower and it was just, you know, as you'd appreciate, just an incredible time in, in markets because it was it was 2008. I think I got there in May 2008 and it was, you know, everything seemed like it was going pretty well and then, you know, obviously it uh, markets generally um, really, really suffered uh, in, in the September, October. Mate, Lauren, yeah, yeah. And it kind of felt like we were really in the heart of things as well because um, that that building that we're in, it was sort of um, it got the, the press started calling it Hedge Fund Hotel. It had GLG Capital, which is a big um, London-based um, hedge fund, but it also had AIG Structured Products, which was the unit really amazing. It was just one floor, but they had lost like billions and billions of dollars on credit details. So we used to have the press would would wait outside our offices and. I want an interview, you know, obviously we had nothing to do with or no interest, but yeah, so it was an amazing time. Um, and yeah, certainly, certainly learned a lot. Um, came back to Australia, um, briefly worked at, um, what they got the time it was Goldman Sachs, Chevy. We, I think NAB had just, just purchased that business and they were going through that transition. Yep. Um, and then I landed a job at, um, at CBA in the, in the private bank. And that's, that's where I spent the bulk of, well, bulk of my career, but um, a good amount of time um, before I started working with Alison Matthews, who's, who still works with me today. Um, and yeah, we sort of started working on, um, they obviously segment, CBA segment their clients, and we were looking after the, the high net worth clients there and um, continue to do that at Coda today. Yeah. So was the Commonwealth Bank, private bank, yep. the high net worth, was, was that anything like the people you were dealing with in London or or for? completely different uh yeah oh, there's certainly similarities um yeah th- there were similarities i mean london sort of had these sort of quirks of um a lot of offshore um business so you had a huge amount of clients who were managed out of jersey and guernsey and yeah uh, the, we had um sort of dealings with swiss-based clients and clients that just had numbers instead of names so funny things there were certainly um nuances and differences in the uk market I think the high net worth market in, in the UK is also fundamentally different to Australia. I think in the main, Australia, you know, it's a newer country. The, 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 you know, there are lots and lots of wealthy people, but most of them have, have done it themselves. In the UK, you know, there's a lot of lords and sirs. And, um, you know, I remember doing a, a KYC of, um, you know, source of wealth. Uh, and the person said, you know, from the 1600s, you know, like it was. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was sort of a big difference. And certainly, there's a formality in the UK that's different in Australia. It's sort of the way that you, uh, I remember getting in trouble saying, I'm um, calling a client mate. My boss yeah. is sign, don't call him mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think Australia a lot, yeah. more, more, lot more relaxed. Yeah. And so you spent a few years at Commonwealth. So, Commonwealth, Commonwealth got out of financial advice. Did you leave before they got out of financial yeah, advice? Yeah, sort of, they were sort of in the process of, of, yeah. of doing that. 
Um, yeah, that they, they as I currently understand, they they're not in retail advice any anymore. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we had a, obviously CBA had well documented um, sort of issues in, in advice that you'd be aware of. But in saying that, in the private bank, we had nothing but you know really good experiences. It was quite distinct from a lot of those things that were happening um, in retail, and uh, and it you know enabled us to to build a great book of um, clients and to for me personally to start working with Alison Matthews who has sort of a more retail financial planning or financial planning strategic background and, and focus, and that's kind of how we work together. I, I'm sort of more investment focused, and she's more on the sort of strategy and, and financial planning side of things. Yep. And and so you refer to Alison as as if, as a business partner. I'm, yep. I'm interested in, like, what does the setup actually look like for you? So, you know, it's like, you know, here there's different people own you know, different proportions of the business, and then, you know, people are employees and so forth. Yep. Like, what What's the structure like yeah so um allison and i are equity partners in in coda there's um 40 odd uh, equity partners in in coda um so we're we're sort of partners in in that sense but also allison and i which is a little bit unique to to coda there's a few teams like us but generally it's um single advisors looking after um clients whereas with allison and i and um, we have sort of taken that team-based approach um to our clients at coda that's what our clients were used to at CBA, where you've got two advisors looking after you, um, and you know we continue to do that uh, at Coda. So you know, the way it sort of works in practice is that we, generally speaking, will both go to meetings together with clients. If there is sort of a modelling, financial planning, super contribution advice, et cetera, et cetera, that's Alison to to run with that. She's often the more of the person that deals with accountants and estate planning, et cetera, um, to do that. But yeah, the idea is that we always share clients from a revenue perspective. It's just a 50-50 split, so it's nice and nice and clean. Yep. And and then underneath you guys, like, would you have a, a, a team of people that work directly with you? How, is it some pool structure? Like, how, What does that look like? Yeah, it's reasonably lean. We're, we're, I was just saying um, before, we were in the process of hiring a, an associate advisor. We sort of reached the, the point in which we, we do really need um, an extra resource. Uh, but really, Alison and I are pretty pretty hands-on with um, with what we do and you know, doing advice, et cetera. And we have a, an amazing um, sort of assistant, administrative assistant um, who helps us. Uh, but we, we certainly are reaching a point where we, we want and need um, extra support. But it is a um, it is a different sort of business to um, sort of a standard financial planning business where there's, you know, can be lots and lots of clients. We have 60 clients. Yes. And, yeah, 60 high net worth clients and a couple of not-for-profit clients. Um, so, you know, you're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of clients to service. Yeah. And we were, we were talking before we, we, we pressed record about, and uh, a lot of business, you know, they're, they're not trying to be the, the advisor, the financial plan, whatever you want to call it. They're not trying to be the, the advisor for everyone. They're, they're pretty narrow in, in who they're wanting to work with. Yeah. So you talk about kind of high net worth and not for profits, but, but is there anything else that kind of identifies yeah, these are clients that we really like to, to to work with. Yeah, so I mean, it's talk to sort of the the average type of um, client. We don't we don't um, we steer away from having sort of hard minimums and saying we'll only look after a client with X dollars, etc. Um, we don't think that's always appropriate. And you know, we've got some fantastic clients that actually started relatively small, but you know, you could see great potential and what they were doing. Yeah. Um, but the average client, if you, if you sort of work backwards, is about. About five billion dollars of invested money with uh, with Coda, mm. some smaller, some larger. Um, there's a we do have a retail and a wholesale license. We're able to provide retail advice, but it's fair to say that the bulk of our attention goes to our wholesale offering. And um, from an investment point of view, there's a lot of investments that are only wholesale off, uh, only. So certainly, if there's a new client walking in the door, our, our preference um, would be to uh, for them to to make that wholesale definition. First of all, but beyond that, it's really sort of a need and a desire for advice. I mean, you, you know, yeah. you can meet someone with ten million dollars, but they love doing it themselves, or they have very strong views and don't really, you know, want your advice. Um, and they, you know, they meet they meet your objective on a sort of financial uh, metric, but they're not, you know, they're not not actually in need or, or don't think they're in need of, of your advice. So I guess that's the the two elements that um, that they generally have a few million dollars to invest most of the time wholesale in in terms of the classification uh, but most importantly you know have a need um for advice yeah and so I, I 
personally don't have a whole lot of experience with. With the differences between the, I guess the advice, the documentation, compliance, whatever you want to call it, that's, it that's required for a wholesale client versus a retail client. You know, we 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 work with clients that would certainly satisfy the definition of of wholesale, but as a business, we've made a decision to just treat everyone as retail, and so yeah. Potentially, that's overkill on, on on certain things. But can you talk us through what the differences are in terms of what's required of you if someone meets a wholesale definition versus they don't? We've always sort of taken the approach that it, even though um, a client may meet a wholesale definition, that we don't want to sort of not do components of the retail process that are you know that are very valuable, and um, you know so we still do fact finds. We still do risk profiling. We still produce wholesale advice documents. They're not necessarily as long as and cumbersome as statements of advice, but we do um, believe that there's there is actually a lot of value in those types of documents. So it's just delivered in a different sort of way. Certainly, that the, the um, our, our focus on on doing wholesale advice isn't driven by like a desire to cut down on compliance. It's really because um, we know that. Um, there's a, a pool of investments that we couldn't otherwise access um, if they weren't classified as um, as wholesale. So that's sort of the main reason. That's the main main distinction. It's not so much about the advice looking dramatically different. Um, it's that there's things that we can include in portfolios that we wouldn't otherwise be. So yeah, more right. of a focus generally on things like private equity, private debt, private infrastructure, various hedge fund strategies that we wouldn't otherwise be able to to get into client portfolios. And and, and where where do those investment opportunities come from? Is that is that you sourcing them? Is it is it Coda sourcing them? Like where did how do the doors open to these opportunities? Yeah, so um, we do have a central research team based out of um, Sydney and on a on a funds perspective that's led by a guy Jason Coggins, um, and so he's sort of tasked with with finding these opportunities. One of the sort of distinctions of of Coda is that uh, we have a sort of real willingness to find offshore opportunities. And I don't mean, you know, a manager based in America that brings a fund to Australia, but actually going offshore and um, speaking to family offices and other CODA-like businesses in New York and Switzerland, et cetera, and finding out what they're investing in. Um, And from time to time, we will bring, if we think it's really attractive, we'll bring that offering back to Australia. But, you know, those types of things are almost always wholesale in nature and not not retail because they you know they're happy for us to um to invest in their um in their structure um but they're not obviously they're not wanting to go through the whole process of getting pds etc and going through that formality of australian um the australian process so yeah for us it's important to have um to that wholesale classification there's also within australia there's a lot of um you know in the private debt space um a lot of providers that um, that focus more on the wholesale rather, rather than the, the retail. It, it is, I and mean, I think it is changing. I, I think retail, you know, it, it really shouldn't be chopped out of some of these important asset classes, and it's starting to. And I think fund managers are starting to focus much more on that. Um, so it's it's making its way through. But yeah, and 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 do you get clients coming to you because they want to? In like, is that one of the big draw cards of clients coming to you? Is that is that they have the opportunity to invest in these? In these things, or is it? It's just part of the process where you're talking about these different opportunities. Yeah, I think it's more part of it, part of the process. I mean, most clients that that um, that come to us are probably similar in clients that would would come to you. you know, they they come to us because you know, they're friends of an existing client or family of an existing client, or um, they're connected to corporate advisory or accountants that we work with. Um, and yeah, I, look. Investments we think is a differentiator. You know, it does look a little bit different. Look at maybe it does occasionally attract people just for that reason. But generally speaking, it's because you know accountants and um, clients have built up a trust and uh, trust in us to to refer to us generally. Yep. Now I, I saw on your LinkedIn in the last week or two, you you'd actually been on a on an overseas trip to look like a research type <laughs> type trip. When, when, like, it was more of a... Uh, was it a desert. holiday or, yeah. or a... <laughs> you people ask me if it was tax deductible. Um, <laughs> it was, no, it was much more of a, a holiday. My, um, okay. my in-laws are, are, are in, in Bangkok. Uh, so it was really just a comment. I look at you, sort of had a... I, get, I put it on LinkedIn as a comment about um, sort of my insights into Asia. We do invest into, into Asian equities um, and... Um, 
you know, it's an area of the market, and including interestingly, Vietnam is a, is an area of the market that we do think is interesting. So it had some relevance to legitimate work, but it wasn't actually a legitimate. Uh-huh. Do, do do you get the opportunity to go to I don't know, talk to some of these family offices overseas or whatever? Do you, do do you yeah. as an individual advisor ever get along to any of those things? Yeah, look, I I personally haven't, but I know that there's quite a lot of partners that that have, and certainly Jason and the research team, you know, regularly do it. And you're off to off to Europe in the next um, week or so. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I would I would like to do that. Uh, it would be great to drop into some of the people that we have in. We've got people all over the world in terms of funds. We've got funds in based out of Munich in Germany and Sweden, in London, so New York, California. So yeah, there's plenty of potential travel such business trips that we could. Uh, someone find. else, okay. yeah, someone else gets them at the moment though. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you you, you spoke about you know, looking to hire an associate soon, uh, and have what you know whatever means you do for that. But what what are your plans for the team going forward? Like, what do you, you know you're however many years you're in, in six or seven years or so in, what are your plans? Yeah, for, for, for that person, um, you know, we we really, I know this is sort of um, an obvious thing to say, but we really want whoever comes on board to um, be long, we call them a coden, a long-term coden, yeah. and really to be aligned to the organization long-term and to sort of grow with it. Um, you know, ideally, we want this person to be an advisor partner. That's the, that's the ultimate objective. Um, you know, we're very... We're very, and I, you probably think about this as well. When you become an equity partner in a business, you kind of think about more about the long term health of the of the business and the future for the business. And undoubtedly, the best thing you can do is bring great young people in that learn and grow and eventually become, you know, significant business writers themselves. It's the only way. You know, we can't keep working forever, um, yeah. and so you've got to do it. So yeah, we think it's a great. Great role. I mean, it's interesting. We've got, we do have some good candidates that, that have applied, uh, but also just anecdotally, it seems like it's a really tight uh, labour market. That you know, good, good people with experience, uh, in, you know, really in hot demand. Yeah, that's it. And it, and it, we, you know, we find the same here. If we're trying to hire into our client services team, for for some reason, we've managed to find some amazing new people into our client services team just in the last couple of months. But we've had other periods of time where we've been trying to hire and for different reasons, it, it it hasn't worked out. Yeah, I think that's just the unemployment. Yeah, the unemployment rate in the country. You know, we get after the economy and inflation and all the rest of it. But uh, that's probably just a reflection of the unemployment rate at the moment. That it's tough to find anyone anywhere. And yeah, yeah it's just seemingly across so many in- industries. You know, talking to clients, it's amazing that this sort of uh, and globally, it seems to be a, a dynamic uh, at play. So it's it's very strange. But um, yeah, I, look, I think we it, it's a great opportunity so i think we'll, we'll find someone good but uh you know it's a really important hire for us we don't want to do it again you know we want to we want to invest the time and get the right person and you know hopefully that person's with us for 20 years yeah are you, are you doing anything interesting in terms of how you, how you manage like the admin side of a business you know technology how you interact with the clients is is, is that you're doing anything interesting in that space yeah i'm i mean you might have seen on a, a linkedin post from a, a few weeks ago i've become completely obsessed with chat gpt <laughs> uh, and and ai i think we're sort of in the you know the very early stages of properly integrating this in a very helpful um way into our processes but i think it'll i honestly think it'll it'll get there and um, one of the challenges with chat gpt is sort of the privacy um side of things and getting you know confidential data into AI, but I think you know, Microsoft will solve that uh, in time. Um, yeah, so there's, there's sort of little things that we do in, in the um, the AI space and do use ChatGPT for, you know, things like helping with spreadsheets and PowerPoints and... Yeah, what, I said, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you prompting ChatGPT with? What, what are you trying to get out of? Yeah, so I'm not using it for things like, um, you know, we, we're working on sort of manual um, spreadsheets as an example. Just to, I just love the way in which you can say, I want my spreadsheet to do this. Can you tell me how to do it? And then it comes back and maybe it's not right and you can talk to it and then refine it and get something that you probably could have Googled and figured out, but it would have been a lot more time consuming. Yeah. Um, I've had to play around with um, uh, VBA, Visual Basics, which is sort of the programming that sits behind um, Excel to automate some some things as well. And again, like ChatGVT does an amazing job at doing that. So I think it does all those sort of things well. I think in, a, in the future, I think you know someone's going to work out a way of integrating um, AI into the production of um, SOAs and advice, et cetera, and 
it'll make everyone's life a lot easier. But I'm just watching this space at the moment. Yeah, I had a I had to play around with it a while ago now and just put some prompts in there to say, no, I need to do a statement of advice. You know, I want to move from this superannuation fund to this superannuation fund, put a cost comparison table in there. And, it, you know, within, took me a bit of prompting backwards and forwards, but within the space of 10 minutes or so, I probably had the outline of what, what we would call in our SOA presentations, one of the tags. So our power planners, you know, there's a list of different strategies that they're yeah. putting in the tags and it, and it spat it out. It's like, this is crazy and yeah it's soon enough yeah but to your point about the um the personal information you need to obviously be really careful about what you're feeding the machine yeah yeah uh for the time being anyway someone yeah. will solve that problem yeah exactly i think someone will have an app that sort of builds off open ai but keeps all your data secure without you loading it on yeah the bit that we're trying to work through at the moment is uh the provision of statements of advice in its video format and that is a lot of advisors that are already doing it where we're, we're trying to build it for because there's a few advisors here we're, we're trying to build it that's a rather than just one person that it's a bit scalable and then there's the whole recording the meetings and the transcribing and there's apps and things but i and in, in my mind it'd be great to get the transcription from this meeting you obviously couldn't do it but put the whole thing in chat gpt and say hey make my file note tell me what my yeah. actions are and yeah and I'll see you going. I'm, sh- I'm sure it could turn it around really quickly, but I can't go putting an hour <laughs> video recording yeah. into into Chat GPT just yet. Yeah. Sure. Well, apparently, um, as I'm, I'm obsessed with this stuff, um, there's something that's very close to coming out called Microsoft Copilot, um, yeah. and it's basically going to use sort of Chat GPT functionality, but sit inside the Microsoft suite of applications. And so, Microsoft Teams, in theory. Um, would um you know you'd be able to take all that script automatically upload it say summarize it i've had to play at it for internal things that aren't sort of confidential um yeah. just to you know summarize what so and so was talking about um and it, yeah it, it does an amazing job um and yeah. even just like i don't know and sometimes people are talking in sort of really complex ways and just like simplify it and it simplifies it so it's yeah, it's pretty pretty incredible and for um you know i wonder about what the world of education is going to look like and how that's going to affect our kids and uh, how they're going to yeah. do what? Yeah, I just can't see them doing education the same way that that we did it. No, nah. well, well, someone someone messaged me on uh, on Instagram saying, "Hey, you know, they're a financial advisor. Do I did I think ChatGPT was going to take over the role of a financial advisor? What do you What do you think? No, I, I look, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think fundamentally there's sort of a need um, and a desire for a lot of people to have that sort of human in- interaction um, and that human uh, human trust. Um, I think, I think at, at the edges, technology was always going to replace parts of financial advice and we've seen robo, et cetera, have some success, but it's sort of still limited. So I'm certainly hopeful that it doesn't, it doesn't replace us, but I, I really doubt that it, that it would. But I do think that, um, I heard a quote somewhere that, you know, chat GPT won't take your job. Someone, someone who knows how to use chat GPT will take your job. And I think that's true. I think there's going to be a, I mean, I think the, the, the fact that Microsoft used called it Copilot, I think that's what it's going to be. It's kind of going to be like a, a virtual assistant that we we're going to need to learn how to harness its power. But I doubt it'll completely replace it. And the other thing is that, and maybe this is a limitation that they can get over. But I don't know if you've had much of a play with it, where you ask it something and it doesn't know the answer. And the whole concept of um you know, of, of the AI is that it, it's basically guessing the next word and um, guessing what's what's coming. And so it can very confidently say things that aren't right, that are just completely wrong. So, I mean, you'd hate to be um, providing completely unfactual, incorrect advice to clients without a human overlay. You do, I think yeah. You definitely need a human going, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And yeah. I think, I think it's like, you now, like all of these advancements, it, it certainly there are elements where it will replace someone's job, but it's also going to create others. And the, the idea of, okay, you're the person that knows how to use chat gpt so that we can get the best outcome for our, for our business yeah that job didn't exist yesterday but t- maybe tomorrow it does um so some will go some will, some will stay but yeah i'm i'm with you i think i think the the role of you know having that conversation and guiding the client and those kind of things there's there's a there's a need for a human element at least for the time being in in all of that i don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon maybe yeah, yeah. other of the of the process can be sped up and made a whole lot more efficient and potentially cheaper for clients and all the rest of it because of his yeah, advancement. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think that you know, it's a different analogy, but you know, the, the calculator didn't 
didn't destroy the math teacher or the engineer. Like it became a tool, yeah. you know. The, the, I, I I do think a lot of these things, and as you say, that we're at really low levels of un- unemployment, and yet we've had all these technological advancements that have displaced people. And the reality is that it's opened up opportunities in other areas. So I take a half glass full approach that we're not all being replaced by uh, machines, but I think we do. You know, where it's incumbent on us to um to really be across it. And I also think yeah. it's, you know, it's exciting. And I think a lot of the things that it's it's replacing and automating weren't necessarily the things we love doing anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anything else that's exciting in? Um, no, not um, in a technology sense. So yeah, yeah, not well, not or, really. Or um, I said that's yeah, that's uh, for me. That's the the most exciting area. I know that I've listened to other podcasts of you of um, people have um, put up interesting um, interesting apps, but no, none that really um, uh, scream out of uh, out to me yeah okay all right well justin thank you for joining me today good to chat good to catch up hopefully uh some people listening along got some value from that very good, good to see you. well yeah very happy to be on and um yeah i look forward to catching up separately thanks thanks Jeff. yeah